This December, I wanted to try something new. Every episode this month will be somebody else interviewing me. I wanted to shout out and support fellow menopause podcasters. And if you enjoy these episodes, please consider also following these women. Starting us off today is Anne Marie McQueen. Anne Marie is a journalist and founder of Hot Flash Inc., a platform to inform, entertain, and encourage women going through the perimenopausal transition. She's here reminding you that while nothing about the transition is easy, it is going somewhere good. Her aim is to give you the best information in the most objective, balanced manner. I'll let Anne Marie take it from here. You're listening to Menopause Natural Solutions. This is episode 182. I am so curious about your perimenopausal journey. Tell me all about what happened. Okay. So I've so far my perimenopause has been in two parts. Mm-hmm. The the first, the early, the initial stages, for me it was like returning to puberty. So the issues that I had in puberty, the headaches, the migraines, that returned. I also found that I wasn't sleeping as well. I was waking up at night hot and sweaty. And for the first time in my life, I experienced anxiety. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> this isn't normal. Let's have a look. What, what's going on here? And I said, well, I'm only 38, but I think this could be perimenopause. So luckily being a practitioner, I've got tools in my toolkit. I made some changes and here I am thinking, ha ha, done. This is perimenopause and I'm winning. And no, mm. <laughs> no. <laughs> it slapped me in the face, but it, Initially, I had what I would just say was a longer, slightly heavier period. I track, and if there's anyone listening, I highly recommend you track your periods if you're still menstruating. It's handy to know what is normal for you and when things are longer or shorter or heavier or other associated symptoms, you've got a track of this. And I just thought at that time, well, I mustn't have ovulated this cycle, and if I didn't ovulate... Therefore, I'm not going to produce progesterone in the second half of my cycle. Maybe it was a thicker endometrium that, that shed. So, you know, a slightly heavier bleed. No problems. Next period. It was a longer and heavier period again. And I'm like, oh, I didn't ovulate two months in a row. Maybe I should start having a look. But maybe it's time to investigate and just see what's going on. So I went to my doctor who gave me a referral for a vaginal ultrasound. And we found a fibroid. And she's like, okay, I need to send you to go and get a hysterectomy. And I'm like, whoa, 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 back right away, right away. Back up. <laughs> I said, I'm not, I'm not against surgery, but if I need to have surgery, I want to have a uterine sparing surgery because mm-hmm. if I can save my uterus, I would like to. So I went to see a gynecologist who went vaginal ultrasound. I can't see anything on this piece of I'm going to send you off to have a sonar histogram. And the difference being with the sonar histogram, your uterus is filled with a saline solution. So everything is plump. It's easier to see. They get a better visualization of what's going on with the uterus. And all of a sudden, I have this collection of polyps and fibroids and it's a whole lot of different things in there, which you didn't visualize in the ultrasound. So she then says, yeah, I think we can do this laparoscopy and I'm like this is better I'm um, potentially open to that and then Australia went into COVID lockdown and they said no oh what's the name of the surgery no elective surgery Uh. I'm like okay all right I just need to do what I can to manage my blood flow and if you've never had a flooding period I guess the best way I can describe it is I've got a maxi tampon in a maxi pad on top of period undies, and I have blood in my socks within half an hour. Wow. Wow. That's that's a flooding period. It's like someone's turned on the tap, and it's not the thick menstrual blood consistency. It's thin, watery blood. Very. And there, there was one particular day where this happened to me three times in a row. So in an hour and a half, I've lost more blood than most women do in an entire cycle, and that was just within like half an hour. Right. Ended up getting referred to a different surgeon, and he was really apologetic. I'm really sorry we can't 
do anything about it at the moment, but I'm going to keep an eye on you. So he checked me for hemoglobin. Now, hemoglobin is a good indication of which blood you've got, whether you're anemic, what's going on. And it in Australia is measured grams per litre. And the normal grams per litre can be like 125, 165. Mine was in the 60s. So I had lost more than half my blood supply. And he's like, I need to check you into emergency. I stayed there for two days, had two blood transfusions, had an iron infusion, and it was no longer elective surgery. We could then move over. And it ended up just being a really simple cure. But it sounds funny, but as a practitioner, I'm almost kind of glad that it happened to me and that there were no long-term serious repercussions because now I understand what a woman goes through. Mm. I understand what heavy blood flow is. I understand what anemia is because at the worst, I was having clots the size of my hand and bleeding consistently 30 days, whole cycle, and very, very heavy flow. But I had to try and put the pieces together. So things like bowel movement, if I had to strain it all for a bowel movement, I would get an increased blood flow. So it was like, how do I have good, soft, easy moving bowel movements that don't trigger any extra blood flow and also want to take iron? So I was trying to figure out how much iron can I actually take orally without it impacting on my bowel. And because of the lockdown we're in, I couldn't get an iron infusion because everything was telemedicine and you can't get an iron infusion over telemedicine. So I started talking to a compounding pharmacist that I work with. She does all my customized pessaries that I use with women. And she goes, why don't you try a transdermal iron? And I'm like, like the sounds of this. I know the skin really can absorb a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, So we were doing up to 150 milligrams of iron transdermally, which there's no way I could have got that in orally. It had zero impact on my digestive system. And I felt the difference. So I'm like, yeah, now I need to tell the world about transdermal line because if you're in a spot like I was, and hopefully no one will ever be in that place, but maybe they are, or maybe there's a wait list for their surgery and they need to wait three months or six months, or maybe they can't take oral iron. The transdermal iron for me was a great option. I'm going to put the heads out that it's expensive. It was $100 a month. But put it this way, I went from sleeping 12 hours a day and having a five-hour nap to sleeping eight hours a day and having a two-hour nap because I wasn't as tired as I was. And the other thing I started thinking about was when you're losing blood, when you're thinking about blood, it's basically a liquid. It's basically water with all these other bits and pieces in. So if I'm losing that much blood in a day, I should at least be trying to drink at least that much water, to trying to drink as much water as I can. And then I started thinking about, well, actually, if I was to do a blood test, you look at your serum electrolytes. So all of my electrolytes are in my blood. I need to put all of my electrolytes back in. So adding, I was doing two daily doses of electrolytes and wow, this made a difference. Okay. Like okay. extreme anemia, you have brain fog, you have dizziness, you do a lot of wall hugging. Mm-hmm. to and from uh, the toilet, palpitations. But for me, if I was experiencing palpitation, I'd have a dose of electrolytes and with 20 minutes they were gone. Okay. Wow, electrolytes are really making a big difference. So I dug out a book that I'd read previously and sat on my shelf for a long time called The Salt Fit. Mm. And I'm just reading back through it and going, salt is so vitally important and it's been so demonized for so long and really it's an essential electrolyte yeah it's one of these salt is one of these things that people avoid and you see in articles all the time if you have a high salt diet and i think people are i think they're more referring to a highly processed diet than than a healthy diet that's rich in minerals and salt is that right but it's like when you read it oh geez i gotta cut down on salt 
I would agree with the processed salt. Yeah. I would agree with the processed food. Um, we don't want to be eating processed foods anyway. So in processed salt, like when you're looking at a natural salt, it has maybe 80 plus trace minerals in it. When you get your table salt, they have processed it, deodorized it, bleached it, and you've maybe got sodium and chloride. You've got two. That's imbalance that's going to cause fluid retention and issues and sometimes they add iodine in so sometimes it's the three this is not really the salt that i'm recommending i'm recommending your, your natural salts like your beautiful celtic sea salt but in my case i was taking it as an electrolyte so i had the full balance of my electrolytes it wasn't just the sodium but for some people i do say well maybe you need to just try a pinch of salt a day and just see if you feel a difference and I quite, rec- I quite often recommend a seven-day electrolyte challenge. Seven days is not long enough to up your soul, but it's long enough for you to go, do I feel a difference? Okay. If you do it for seven days and you feel a difference, you've been salt deprived. But my, my warning there is, if you've been told by a healthcare practitioner to be on a low-salt diet, then there could be other factors that we haven't discussed today. Like I don't know your medical history. I'm not your doctor. In that kind of case, I would go back and see whoever told you that in the first place so that you can discuss with them whether you think or maybe you feel that you could do with a bit more salt, but just get some more details from them and maybe read the book, The Salt Fix, so that you've got a better understanding of of the research. Because when the original salt restrictive requirements or guidelines came into place, there was no such thing as scientific study. Mm. It was, it was like, like fats were demonized for so long. And now we know there's various forms of fat and some of them are absolutely essential that we need to have. So a uh, seven day electrolyte challenge, what would that involve? So just taking a dose of electrolyte daily for seven days and seeing how you feel at the end of it. Most women will say that they feel that they have more energy that there's clarity in their thoughts, that their brain fog's maybe not as strong or not existent anymore, that maybe if you're having palpitations, you're not getting palpitations anymore, that maybe you feel more solid in um, your stance, so not as much dizziness or lightheadedness, just generally an increased vitality. But if at the end of the seven days you don't notice anything, then stop it. But to be honest, no one's ever told me that you don't feel any different. Oh, if, if you don't feel the difference, please email me so I can say, right, I know one person. What do you have a kind of electrolytes that you recommend? So I recommend any clean electrolytes. And by that, I mean no colors, no flavors, no preservatives. If it's pre-made and fluorescent, put it back on the shelf. Don't touch it. So the product that I personally use is a U.S. product that is a concentrate. And I just pour a cap of it into a glass of water. But I know that we're podcasting people all over the world are listening. So have a look, go into the shops and or maybe to a health food store or a pharmacy and just ask them, you know, I'm looking for a concentrated electrolyte with no colours, flavours, preservatives, and see what you can find. If you can't find anything, I would grab a pinch of Celtic sea salt, add it into your water and try it that way. Okay. I'm laughing because I when I was at a young girl in the 70s. My mom was a nurse and she, we'd be shopping or something and I'd be tired and she'd say, oh, let's get you a Coke. Like it's, it's got, it's good. It's got electrolytes in it. and we'd have a, we'd have a Coca-Cola and be revived. My mom was always telling me about Coke and how it had electrolytes in it, which I think it probably has some, some electrolytes. It has some salt in it, probably. I really don't know, but I can think of Better ways to boost your energy than adding in all that sugar. Yeah. I mean, you know, basically we're just getting a sugar high and going on your way. It's just, that's where I've heard electrolytes from my mom, who was a nurse, telling me to get them from Coke. So things have changed. Can so we can go back to the fibroid because I also had fibroids. And ever since then, I've become obsessed with why are these things growing? I have a friend who's 40 who was just diagnosed. She's having a terrible time. They're kind of in between the wall of, I, I don't know exactly, but they're kind of embedded in a way that mine wasn't. Mine was e- easily removed, but she's having the terrible bleeding. And again, I'm just like, why are these things growing? Is this estrogen dominance from 
I mean, just me, not, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, but is this like from all the endocrine disruptors that are around or what are your theories and what do you, what do this as science sort of say to you, do you think? Yeah, it's multifactorial. So you're, you're right in estrogen dominance and the environmental link. But if we start at the beginning, it can be genetic. So if you've had a first degree relative have fibroids, then you've got a one in three chance of developing fibroids yourself. If you are overweight, you actually also have the same risk, a one in three increased risk of developing fibroids. Most women that do develop fibroids have some sort of hormonal imbalance, hence why perimenopause is such a, a common time for them to develop. During perimenopause, you don't always ovulate. And when you've missed an ovulation, what it means is that there's no progesterone in the second half of your cycle. And when you don't have progesterone in the second half of your cycle, the endometrium can grow. Like estrogen is a, a growth hormone. It's, it's plumping and ripening that endometrium. And it's normally the drop in progesterone that triggers for it to bleed. But if you don't have the progesterone there, it can get what we call endometrial hyperplasia, when you get that increased lining, the increased thickness of the lining. And the first kind of signs of this is heavier bleeds, longer bleeds, bleeding between cycles. Yeah, so changes with the length of the cycle and changes with the length and the heaviness of the bleed. But when your lining is not shedding properly, you are then more prone to develop polyps because polyps are a collection of endometrial cells that weren't shed properly in the former period. So the difference between polyps and fibroids is the tissues that they're made out of, where polyps are the endometrial lining and your fibroids are more connective tissue. So you can get really deep fibroids where polyps are really superficial. They're on the, on the outside lining. So I feel for your friend, that's not a, not a fun place to be. Mm -hmm. Um. What else do you want to know about fibroid? What else do I want to know? Okay, first of all, I want to go back to these anovulatory cycles because I never knew about this. So I think a lot of people think, well, I'm having my period every month, so that's a healthy indicator. But these cycles are are becoming more common, I think, even when you're not in perimenopause, it seems like. And during COVID, a lot of people had them. There was just a study that came out that said during COVID, people were having them. And you know that this is happening because you're you're bleeding more, like your bleeding changes, or it's a sign? Well, some people, some women notice, some women don't notice. Yeah. So if you move further down the like at the beginning of the cycle, leading up to ovulation, some women experience or feel the twings or the twangs of ovulation pain. So you, pain might not be the right word. It might just be a little twinge that, oh, that was, that was. Middle schwartz. Isn't it called middle schwartz? Yeah. Yes. 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 That's it. I always remember. So, yeah. Not, not all women experience that. So some women might know, okay, I didn't ovulate this period because I didn't feel it. But generally the signs are an, a change in the bleed. So it can also be the color of the bleed, the thickness of the bleed, the clottiness, yeah. the amount of fibrous tissue that you can also get with the bleed. And so that, that's hormonal imbalance. But with perimenopause, we're going from hopefully ovulating 12 times a year to ovulating zero times a year. And that doesn't just happen. I know we talk about menopause being that one year since your last period, but in that 10-year period prior to then, you might go from having 12 ovulations a year to having nine, to going back up to 10, to going down to six, to back up to... It's, it's a little bit a roller coastery up and down and all over the place. And some women might not notice a difference and some women will notice a, a huge difference. But hormonal imbalance is... It can be internally. Or it can also be externally. So you've mentioned environmental factors. So we do have xenoestrogens in the environment. So things like plastics that cause an estrogen-like effect in the body. And unfortunately, we live in a toxic world mm -hmm. that we are surrounded by this toxic soup. We can clean it up, obviously. We can make our home environment. We can get a water filter. We can get an air filter. We can make big changes from, from what we do every day by getting rid of your plastic. Certainly not drinking in plastic water bottles to getting 
glass or our stainless steel water bottles, these, these do make a big difference. But you also need to look at how you metabolize your estrogen and whether you're actually excreting old estrogen or whether you're recycling. So the health of your digestive system might surprise people, but it plays a huge role. If you've been like a constipated person, you may not have been excreting your estrogen properly, right? This is is the situation with my friend. She's putting all these pieces together that she's always had that issue and that she wasn't properly excreting her estrogen and that this may have contributed. Yes. Um, So for myself, after I had my fibroids removed, I went back and had a look at all the contributing factors that Mm. could have potentially led to my growth. Because we have a one in eight chance of them regrowing. And I don't want to go through the other 10. Like I've had that experience. I don't need it a second time. I learned my lesson. Yeah. So I went and got a whole range of functional tests for myself. And one of those was a GI map. Now there's plenty of companies that do really good microbiome testing. And this is just the one that I use because I can access it. And it tests my beta glucuronidase levels. So I could see that within my digestive microbiome, there's a subpart called the estrobilome. And with that, it looks at whether you actually excrete your used estrogen or whether you recycle it. So when we've used our estrogen, it gets like a sugar molecule added to the top, like a tag to say, right, you are heading out. And what beta-glucodonorase is, is like a pair of scissors that chops it off. So all of a sudden, it's meant to be exiled, excreted from the body. But it's like, woohoo, I get to go around another time. And it it goes around. So I realized that I had a fair bit of that going on. So I could make some digestive changes, make some microbiome changes to reduce my chances of of that happening again. The other thing I looked at was a a specific vaginal microbiome test. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see what was going on there, whether there was any, and like there's not necessarily bad bugs. Like it's, I'm not looking for gonorrhea or anything like that, but some just little microbiome changes. Like it could be a little bit of urea plasma or a little bit of mycoplasma, just common every day, not sexually transmitted, but just microbiome changes that, that you can tweak. And I also did a Dutch test because I wanted to have a look at how my estrogens were being metabolized. So it can go down the two, the four, or the 16 pathway. You really want to check that your estrogen is being metabolized down the right pathways to reduce your chances of it being a cancerous growth. So yes, I'm growing things, but in in my particular case, they were all benign. There wasn't a problem. And when I looked at this, I could see that I was going down the correct pathways. I just had a lot, a huge amount of estrogen. That was going down. So by doing the GI map, I could see, ah, it's because I'm recycling them, (laughs) making them do the lap again. So there's there's things that you can look at to reduce your risk of it coming back. And if you do still have your fibroids, there's things you can do, those same testing, those same treatment protocols. For some women are enough that they can live with their fibroids until postmenopause. Because in postmenopause, Fibroids resolve on their own. And right. You don't need to do anything about them, but you just need to survive from wherever you are to postmenopause. And in my case, that wasn't going to happen. Right. That was, wasn't going to happen. You had a long time to go as well, even if they weren't as serious. They were. In my case, I was, I think, 43 and single. And the doctor said, do you think you want to have children? And I, it, she said, if you meet someone... I can help you in two years fertility wise, but if you have this fibroid, I I won't be able to help you. So I thought, well, I'll give myself the chance. But do you think, I don't know, because I did try for a while to shrink it with acupuncture and diet and it wasn't really working. And so I don't know, what's your take on that? So if that's what the woman sitting in front of me wants to do, I put timeframes in place. I said, let's work on something for, for three months. And let's see how many different factors we can find. Because if we can't find gen dominance, if we can't find that there's been a high xenoestrogen load, if we can't find beta glucodonorase, like we can't find these other factors, then there's no point waiting three months. You actually need to to have something different. You need to plan a different 
um, approach, then say, okay, we're doing this different now. Let's wait three months and see what changes you've, you've experienced. Because if you haven't experienced any, I wouldn't wait to six months. I would say, right, now it's time to up level. But if you had started to experience some changes, it might be a reduction in bleeding, then you might go, oh, this is promising. Let's wait six mm. months and see how you go. It's certainly not something that I would open-endedly, let's just keep trying it within reason. Another cause is inflammatory factors. So if there's been any insulin resistant blood sugar irregulation, like I did mention obesity, but I didn't mention that blood sugar irregularity can also be a, a growth factor. It can really stimulate growth of fibroids and yeah, you don't want that. So balancing out blood sugar, working on diet can play a big role. And there's also some medications that can, can trigger or can potentially enhance the growth of the fibroid. So just also want to check what medications and things you're on. Okay. Um, what are those? So when you're looking at polyps specifically, tamoxifen is an anti-breast cancer drug. And I'm, I'm not knocking it. If you're on it, stay on it, please. But although it's anti-cancer on the breast tissue, it may have a proliferative effect on the uterus. So in most cases, they will just do extra monitoring just to make sure everything's good. Um, I certainly don't want to scare anyone off taking that medication. If you're on it for a very good reason, please stay on it. But if you've never had anyone say that there could be any risk factors with it, it's worth opening up that conversation with, you, with your doctor to just say, do I need extra monitoring? And if anything comes up, what? What can I do? Are there any alternative to tamoxifen? But in most cases, it's just extra monitoring. I'm curious about if you keep this fibroid with you, you keep it, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. and then you go into menopause or in perimenopause, you decide to take hormone therapy. What's the impact then? Like Theoretically, I guess if you're on estrogen and progesterone, if you have a uterus, the progesterone should offset any estrogen type growth or what happens? It depends on what kind of growth you're growing because there are, there are some links with polyp growth that even if you're, you're postmenopausal, you're on HRT and even with the addition of progestin, you can still get polyps and most postmenopausal bleeding is due to polyps. Any postmenopausal bleed should be investigated. Okay. That, that's quite important. I'm curious what you're seeing. You probably pay attention to the current conversations about perimenopause and menopause. Are there, is there anything you're seeing that you're like, ah, I want to correct that? Or, oh, I wish I could pipe into that conversation right now. So salt is just the big one that I think is missing from the conversation. So that is something that I try to mention as often as I can, where I really see a lot of women are starting at the end. Like they're sort of going, okay, perimenopause, it's a hormonal thing. I should get some hormones. But I don't necessarily see that. I think like as a naturopath, I don't treat the condition. I treat the whole woman. So if a woman wants true health, I've got to start at the beginning. Like what are the key building blocks for health? And for me, minerals a key building blocks for health. Because if you've got a mineral deficiency, a hormone replacement is not going to fix it. And nothing's going to fix it but the minerals. So I would start with diet. I would start with minerals, might look at some vitamins. Then I might build up and go, well, what else is going on? Can I put in some herbs, some mushrooms? What might interest you is I had a look at the beginning of the year at all of the women that I've seen as patients. And I found that 20%, it was just under the 20%, it's so probably 18 percent of my patient load was already on some sort of hormone replacement when they came to see me. Ooh. So they, they had got some relief from their symptoms, but it wasn't everything they had hoped it could be. And so we just started addressing some of the other factors, some of the, like I would say, the start, like the stepping stones, like we'd start with, you know, what's your diet like? Could you use more minerals? And I found that through the rest of the population that I was seeing, there was about 7% of women that I actually said to them, look, I think you'll get better results stepping up to hormone replacement. Okay. And for, for those women, a lot of it was vaginal estrogen mm -hmm. that maybe we'd started using some compounding pessaries and I've asked them, are you happy with these results? And if they say they're happy with these results, okay, great. 
Good. Tick. Right. And that's the next complaint. If they go, oh, there's still a little bit of this, still a little bit of that. And I go, well, this would be a good time to try vaginal estrogen, just so you can see the difference. You can always stop it and come back to the compounding pessary, but then at least you've got a comparison. And I've only had one woman come back to the pessary from the estradiol, but yeah, a lot of women do notice, especially when they're having extreme vaginal dryness, Mm. that some of them do need it. The compounding pessary, can you explain that? I'm not familiar Hmm. with that. So it depends on the woman sitting in front of me and what's going on with her. But I have a relationship with a compounding pharmacist and I will send her scripts and she will make things up. So the most common vaginal pessary, I've got to watch saying pessary because in the US they say suppository. Ah, okay, suppository. (laughs) Yeah, is vitamin E. So vitamin E is a mucous membrane trophorestorative. So it helps to restore the integrity of the mucous membrane. So it could be that there's some vitamin E that I pop in there. Zinc is another interesting one where there's, I haven't personally used zinc in my prescriptions, but I've been looking at the research and I've been tempted to include it. Because when I look at the digestive system, if I looked at the digestive system as a brick wall, You've got zinc molecules and you've got your essential fatty acids. So zinc, I think, is the brick and the essential fatty acids, I think, about the mortar. So for both your, all your mucous membranes and your, your skin. I think the, the vaginal mucosa, it's, it's mucosal. Why wouldn't I use zinc there? And there's been some really interesting pilot studies. And the last pilot study was just before COVID. And at that point, they went, we're so happy with the results. We're going to do a double-blind placebo control trial, comparing it with vaginal estradiol. But Hmm. COVID happened. So I don't know what happened. I don't know if that was cancelled or postponed. So that's something to watch. But when I spoke to my compounding pharmacist friend about, ah, look at this research I found, should we chuck Zinc in, she said, it depends on the zinc molecule because zinc can be quite harsh and quite irritating. So yeah. if you've got zinc drops at home, do you think not? Put them in. It. I no, no, no. Right away, I'm thinking, what it can, you know, this, can you just put vitamin E in your vagina? Like those gel caps? Really? It depends on the caps because you want one that's going to dissolve. You don't want to wake up the next morning and it still be whole. Yeah. Right. But you can you can commercially buy vitamin E, pessary suppositories, whatever you call them, that are made for made for that role. Okay. I would just I sometimes start there depending on a woman's budget. If she didn't have the money, that's where we would stop. If she was happy to add in other bits and pieces, then I would go to the compounding pharmacist. And you can actually put in so whatever ingredients you want. If you want herbs like fennel, hyaluric acid. Um, other vitamins. So all of your fat soluble vitamins are really good for mucous membrane integrity. So I might even just do a A D E K. <laughs> it's topical application. Like you would topically apply something on your skin. You mm-hmm. can topically apply it vaginally. This is amazing. And I love what you said about starting at the end. Because I mean even starting at the end vaginally is like going straight to vaginal estrogen and being on it for the rest of your life and you're saying maybe that you can just do some work to restore the mucous membranes before and maybe that will work and there's nothing wrong with that but it feels like in the current conversation it's almost heresy to say that now that's one of the things that i feel what do you think (laughs) for me it depends on the woman sitting in front of me because i'm there to listen to her to hear her goals what does she want to achieve if she's come to see me and she can't wear jeans it hurts to walk I'm going to say you need some relief. We need to go there, but I need to also let you know there are these other things. So if you start there and you're happy with the results and that's where you want to stay, great. That We've ticked that box for you. But if you do want to downgrade, uh, I guess for me the biggest thing is telling women there are options. And, okay, my options for me might be different from your options from you, but it's good for both of us to know. Mm. There are options. So we can we can start wherever we want and see how we go, knowing that we can upgrade or downgrade. I'm very curious about the vaginal microbiome because there's there's actually a project in the US called Virgo. They mapped the vaginal microbiome. 
And I'm expecting more information to come out of that because they've mapped it and they're making it available. And I know I'm just really interested in that part because, I mean, it is connected to your gut, the vaginal microbiome. I actually would have said that Europe was possibly leading the way there. There's a company called Invivo. I'm not quite sure where they're located, but they've they've been doing vaginal microbiomes for years. Okay, so the U.S. thinks it's leading, but it's that's never See, happened. That's, that's that's what I love about having a global population. Yes. Working, I learned so much. Like last year, I was working with a Mexican woman. I'm learning about Mexican vegetables that I've never heard of before, and it's awesome. It's amazing, and. No, I'm yeah, saying, so I'm the same. I wanted this pot, hot flashing to be global because ever since I moved overseas and you've lived abroad, then you realize like where you're from is not where it's at. <laughs> so at Vivo, I'm going to check that out. I realized I had SIBO and I had to heal it this last year. And I didn't know I had SIBO and had a terrible run of like BV and stuff I just could not get rid of. And it's funny because there's doctors on, very vocal doctors on Twitter and social media saying, don't trust this probiotic that's saying it will help your vagina because they're not connected. And I'm just like, I, I think they are. In my whole life, if I've come to a vacation and drank beer and ate terrible food, I've come back with, it affects, it. Uh, many women know that it affects it. You just, to common sense. Question for you, with your vaginal probiotic, where did you put it? Which end? No, I, I'm seeing, I wasn't taking a vaginal probiotic, oh, okay. a gut probiotic. But then there's okay. this one said, if you take our probiotic, we'll help your vagina. It was being marketed as a vaginal probiotic that you mm-hmm. take. I don't know if that's true or not. All I know is, there is- oh, my gut bi- microbiome is off. Well, my gut is off. I can get, and I think a lot of women know this. Yeah, but there are strains of probiotics that do have an affinity for the, for the vagina. And they're going to be the better strains to take. And something that you mentioned that I thought is also worth mentioning is that a lot of women in perimenopause will come up and say, oh, I've got some thrush. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, how do you know that? Well, this kind of symptoms. And I'm like, but at this stage of life, it's more likely to be bacterial. It's more likely to be BV, bacterial vaginosis, than thrush being more yeast-based infection. So don't just assume that if you've had something, oh, it must be that because I've had that all through my 20s. It's like a different stage of life. This this exactly happened to me. And then you go get the canastin or whatever the brand name is where you are and it doesn't work. And you're like, oh my God, I have some terrible thing. Yeah. I I never, I think I had BD once in my life before my perimenopausal life. And then yeah, it's like I could just look at something that would give you <laughs> things under control now. Okay, final question. What would you say, like if someone's really struggling right now with perimenopause, what, what would just be some, just some things that you would sort of work for the majority of women? Well, I guess I would start with, with journaling, with actually writing down your symptoms and just seeing if you can find any correlation, any cause correlation. Like we know we've hot flushes, that a lot of these are triggered by external circumstance. It could be that you run for the bus. It could be that you've got an overdue work deadline. It could be that you've just had alcohol or that you've had a coffee, that there can be external triggers for some of your internal symptoms. So I really think writing things down and looking for patterns can help you to become your own detective, to find your own solutions, to go, ah, look at this. It happens. I have night sweats every Friday night, but every Friday after work to go and have a bottle of wine with a friend. That that could be some of your symptom matching that you can do. As a general rule, cleaning up your diet, getting rid of sugar. Um, sugar is so inflammatory, causes so many issues. So getting back to eating vegetables, fruits. I am a big fan of animal protein. Sorry if that offends anyone, but there are essential amino acids that we need and they're easiest to get the quantity that we need when we're having animal products. So I would say journal and clean up your diet and and, 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 and start moving Ah. and also to take care of yourself, to not 
be too down and hard on yourself. If, oh, I didn't move today. It's like, well, it's good if you can. It's very helpful if you can, but beating yourself up is not doing anyone any favors. Like you have to be your own advocate. You have to be your own best friend and be kind. Okay. And what are you excited about? What research are you, we've already talked about some research you're excited about, but mm-hmm. what are some areas or, or an area that you're particularly excited about? I always get excited when I see natu- any sort of natural therapies in research, whether it's Rare. minerals or herbs or mushrooms. It's like, what? <laughs> Itself. Yeah, so this year I've been doing a lot of reading just on minerals and it's fabulous to see the amount of mineral research done. Okay, a lot of it's been done on women who rather have breast cancer or who've had breast cancer and are looking for non-estrogen based therapies. But there's been some phenomenal research on magnesium and how that can help with so many symptoms of perimenopause, menopause, from hot flushes, night sweats, and better sleep, better bowel movement, less anxiety, better mood. It's really the, I call it the master menopause mineral. It's amazing. We're almost all deficient. I thought of one more question for you. Go for it. Liver. Why do you think like the role of the liver and how we've sort of pounded our liver in various ways by the time we hit perimenopause? I feel like it's not discussed enough. I don't know. What do you think? Well, you quite often see liver enzymes rise. If you're looking at your blood testing, so another thing that I recommend is that you always get a copy of your test results. You don't just go in and your doctor goes, everything's fine. Say, awesome, can I have a copy? And take it home. And if you can, I recommend you create a spreadsheet so you can start tracking things. And sometimes even within the range, you notice, oh, actually, I'm tracking up. I'm not outside of the range yet, but I've gone from being maybe one number inside the range to all the way through the range and I'm maybe one number. And the doctor won't mention it until you go outside of the range, but you could have moved a very long way. And I think it's helpful. So you can then go and ask these questions. Well, why do you think my liver enzymes have gone up? And you can look at diet and lifestyle. Have you been, have you been drinking too much? Could it be the xenoestrogens are having an impact? on your your liver. And I also look at iron. So iron, not so much in perimenopause, but in postmenopause. When we stop menstruating, when we stop bleeding, our iron levels can start to rise. Iron has an affinity for storage in the liver, also the brain and the bones. So it can go in into other places. But it's interesting that sometimes women have noticed, oh, my liver's gone up. And I ask them, well, have you checked your ferritin? And they said, no, they don't know that correlation that excess iron can live in the liver and that can be contributing to a whole host of symptoms. Okay. There's a lot to, there's a lot to keep Sorry, on Sorry, that wasn't a short answer. <laughs> oh, no, I shouldn't just throw a question about the liver at you at the end of our podcast. That would be a whole probably podcast. Anyway, I love talking to you. This is really, this is really interesting and I'm glad we've connected. And I love the international view and the accents on too. Thank you. Thank you for having me.